Today's topic that we're talking to Dr. Tina Feely about is sleep. Tina, can you tell us a little bit about how much training um, you get understanding baby's sleep when, when you train to be a pediatrician? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when you train to be a pediatrician, a lot of the training is focused more on um, medical diagnoses and things like that. And, but there is a lot of emphasis on growth and development. So a lot of our sleep information came from those types of trainings, but it was more based on at what age can a baby fall asleep and stay asleep throughout the night and not have to feed in the middle of the night, for example, for adequate growth and development. Um, a lot of information was about how much sleep they should get throughout the day, but not necessarily in how much um, in terms of naps throughout the day versus at night or what type of schedule, how often they should nap. It was more kind of a, you know, on average, a newborn sleeps X amount of time throughout the day. And then at four months, they sleep, um, you know, uh, in another increment of time. So that was kind of um, more of the training that we got. And then a lot of it was based on sleep disorders. So things like narcolepsy and, and things like that, that you would diagnose with a sleep study, for example, or obstructive sleep apnea and, and things of that nature. But not so much in terms of the everyday nitty gritty that I think that parents really want to know, which is when should I be putting my baby to sleep? How long should they be sleeping for? For how long? Where should they be sleeping? Um, the other thing we emphasize a lot in our pediatric training is safe sleep. So where should a baby be sleeping? Um, and that is important to always um, have the baby for every single nap and sleep, sleep on a you know, firm, flat sleep surface, ideally in a crib or bassinet um, with nothing else in the crib or bassinet um, to make sure that they are on their backs as well, um, to make sure that they are in the safest position. So we focus a lot on, on safe sleep and things like that. Great. So not, ex, not, as you said, not much information is really given to you around just general sleep patterns, I suppose. It's more, yeah, diagnose issues mm -hmm. that happen with sleep. Exactly. And the overall in, in 24 hours, how much should they be sleeping, but not necessarily telling parents or, or P, us as, as pediatric trainees at uh, what that looks like in a typical day for a family. Right, right. So before finding our program, how comfortable were you giving advice to other families around their, their own babies and children's sleep? You know, it was funny because before finding the program, I... I thought I was comfortable talking about sleep, but then after becoming a mom, I realized that what I was saying was just not totally realistic for what an actual parent is going through at night when your baby is crying all night and awake. Um, because a lot of it, a lot of what we focused on in our training was regarding when a baby should be able to sleep through the night. We didn't really focus on how much sleep they got during the day to optimize their sleep at night, which I think is something I definitely took for myself my, with my own child um, and have uh, instituted into my practice as something I learned from little ones, actually. Um, because we would say, well, the earliest you can realistically expect a baby to sleep through the night um, and sleep train them is, is around four to six months, depending on the development of the child. Um, and by that, a lot of times we talked about just let them cry it out and be, um, just be consistent when you decide to start, you know, having them cry it out to, to be consistent with it. But it's not really, some parents are fine with it and, and that's fine. It's not harmful to the child to do that, but um, it is really stressful for a lot of parents to just sit and let their ch child cry all night. And I think um, I hadn't really realized how much I could talk about things that the parent could do during the day that would optimize sleep at night, which was a lot easier to implement for parents because they're already awake. So things like optimizing their nap time during the day and making sure that they're napping in the same place that they're going to be going to sleep at night and, and things that you're already awake. It's not you're trying to sleep in the middle of the night and why won't my baby go to sleep? But these are things you can actively do for your child. Um, during the day while you're awake that I think was really beneficial to me as a parent and that I've kind of 
been discussing with my patients more and more. So now, how has your sleep advice uh, been influenced by having a child yourself? I think you mentioned already around like just telling parents to just let it let the baby cry it out, I guess, you know, emotionally after you have a baby that can be very distressing for some parents. So is that something that's changed? And can you give us any other I, examples? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I now tell parents that you can let your child cry it out if you want. It is not going to, you know, harm them if you know that they are in a safe environment and that their needs are met in terms of their bed and they are dry and they are warm and, and all of those things. You can let them cry it out if it becomes a habit um, for them to wake up in the middle of the night. But um, I realize that for the majority of parents, it's not something that is realistic. It was not something that I could handle. It was funny. We would time our daughter to try to give her time to work it out and figure out how to get herself back to sleep and say, okay, we're going to let her cry for 10 minutes. And then all of a sudden you look down at the clock and it had been two minutes and you were like, oh my gosh, I can't take it. <laughs> and go in and get her. Um, so I think I, I definitely focus more now on my advice with parents on things that they can do throughout the day. So things like optimizing their nap time, things like creating structure in their day. So not letting them cat nap for 20 minutes here and 20 minutes there, wherever they are, but um, really setting a schedule for them and, and letting them kind of adhere to that schedule and, and making sure that they put them in the same place to sleep during the day as much as they can um, for where they're going to nap at, or where they're going to sleep at night, having them nap during the day as well in that, in that same environment. Um, so those are, I think, some of the things that ultimately have, have changed, where my focus is not so much on what to do in the middle of the night when they're crying and waking up, but more what you can do during the day that actually will help you for night, and then deciding at night if we get to the point where you've done everything and you've optimized their day and you've set a schedule and you've stuck with it and they're doing great on the schedule, but nighttime's still the issue, then we troubleshoot okay, what's going on at night that's different than what you're doing during the day? If they're going down just fine for their naps in their crib and, and um, not having issues, then what's happening at night that might be affecting it um, as well? And, and we, I think, can have a little more of a discussion than just, ah, oh, you're being too lenient, just let them cry. And, you know, eventually it'll be a horrible week, but then they'll be fine for the rest of their life. But, you know, that, that's not a realistic expectation yeah. either. <laughs> Yeah, no, that sounds exactly the same as what we advise really is just sort the day out first, make sure everything is so much easier throughout the day. And then mm -hmm. hopefully the night comes in to, and, and makes, you know, the baby starts consolidating their night sleep. And then, as you said, if things start still going badly at night, then sort out the night time. But yeah, and it's much easier. Absolutely. And even for the mom, I know for myself, when I had found um, little ones, it didn't actually make that much of a difference in my daughter's sleep at night for, um, you know, a few weeks, or yeah. maybe even a month. But it made a big difference in her day very quickly. And that made a big difference in my day because I was able to actually get things done and leave the house and have an expectation of when I could leave and when I could come back and not have a meltdown in the middle of the grocery store or something. Um, and that made it easier to deal with the issues at night as well as a mom. So even though it didn't necessarily change her sleeping patterns at night right away, it changed my outlook as well. So I also kind of help parents to deal with that as, as well to say, well, you can have a little more of expectation of how your day is going to go, which I think can make some of the chaos of the night a little easier as well if you're not feeling like it's a 24-7 thing. And you, can, and you can see definitely, like if you're traveling or something and, and you, your baby hasn't slept as much as what you're kind of used to now with them on the mm -hmm. routine or the schedule, you can see that how immediate that effect is of that day was a bad day. So I'm definitely going to have a bad night, you know, so your expectation is dropped, I suppose. So you know that that's what is going to happen rather than, exactly. being like, Oh, I'm not sure. <laughs> exactly. I can't tell you how many times my husband and I will say, Oh, okay. Well, she's going to bed late tonight. So 
you know, we'll say, is it, is it worth it? Are we having fun right now? Okay, we're having fun. We're willing to have a bad night tonight or something. But, but you have that expectation and it's a lot more predictable, which makes all the difference, I think, for your own psyche as a parent. Yeah, definitely. I agree. And so what are some of the um, most common sleep questions that you would get asked as a pediatrician? Um, so by and large, the number one question is, how can I get my baby to sleep through the night? <laughs> so, um, but it's actually a hard question to answer because I find everyone has, um, their definition of sleeping through the night is different. So for some parents, it's, you know, getting four hours of sleep, some parents is getting six hours sleep. Some parents it's, I went to bed at the normal time I would go to bed and I woke up at the normal time I would wake up and I, my baby did not wake me up in between that time. So, um, a lot of uh, the questions I get are, are revolved around that, but they require some discussion with the parent about what their expectations are as well. Um, I get a lot of questions about how much should my baby be sleeping. For example, a lot of parents will come in with newborns that are concerned that they're sleeping all the time and it seems like they're only sleeping or eating and let them know that that is what we expect, that there's nothing wrong with their baby, that's what we think they should be doing. Um, and then the, a lot of questions um, regarding uh, what they can do to uh, sleep train and, and what sleep training entails and which method I recommend and, and things like that. And I try to tell parents, you know, whatever you decide to do, just be consistent with it. And I think that that's the most important thing is to set a schedule and be consistent and have a consistent pattern with your child. So same bedtime routine and around the same time and putting to bed in the same place and, and things like that. But um, I think parents are, sleep is definitely one of the major things that is stressful for parents for a lot of obvious reasons. Yeah, I agree. And what do you think um, parents struggle with the most when it comes to sleep? So I think one thing that parents struggle with a lot is the issue of safe sleep. Um, a lot of times the newborns, especially parents will come in and say they only sleep when they're sleeping on me and I can't get them to sleep in their bassinet and their, or they can say, I only get them to sleep when they're in their car seat or something like that. And so I think emphasizing to parents the importance of safe sleep and that even though your baby might be sleeping in something like um, their car seat or, or another device that is not actually meant for sleep, um, that it's not worth it for the dangers that can be associated with those. But I could understand how it would be easy to fall into those patterns if, you know, you your child fell asleep in the car and you left them in their car seat and stayed asleep for the longest they've ever slept in their life. I can understand how a parent would want to do to to continue that, but um, emphasizing the importance of a baby sleeping on a, a separate sleep surface, ideally a bassinet or um, their crib, flat on their back with nothing else in the crib or the bassinet is absolutely the most important thing. When parents have found another solution that they've found to get their child to sleep longer but that it's an unsafe solution i think it's it's hard for parents to go back to the sleep the the safe sleep methods um so one of my jobs as a pediatrician is just emphasizing all the time that no matter what you're finding your child is sleeping better if it is not a firm flat surface um ideally a bassinet or a crib with nothing else in the bassinet or the crib and they're on their back that is the safest way for them to be sleeping. Um, I think the other thing that parents really struggle with the most is also the idea of sleep training. So they come in and they're very anxious about saying, I have to sleep train. And, um, and to them, that means some, like I have to make my child cry throughout the night. So I think that's one thing that they come in very stressed out about and asking me my opinions on, um, or which method to sleep train that I think is the best. But, um, you know, talking to them about how you don't necessarily need to, to sleep train by crying it out. There are a lot of different ways to do it and, and having those discussions um, can definitely be helpful. But I think those are the two probably biggest things that, that parents are coming in talking about. I think with the, um, with the making sure that the babies are actually 
going to sleep in a safe a safe sleep environment i think the hardest thing probably for parents is if they have like you said found another way of getting their baby to sleep easily they actually just don't understand that there are methods of being able to get your baby to go to sleep in that flat surface on their back <clears throat> i'm sorry exactly. um you know they don't, they don't realize that you can just bum pat them and they will go to sleep or you could turn on uh, some white noise or the like a shh noise and that will help them soothe and calm down and and you know you don't have to just put them in the bassinet and let them cry and go to sleep you know right exactly but um refraining there's also a lot of things on um the market that are actually um marketed for sleep but then if you actually look at them they say not intended for sleep because they're unsafe um so i find it it's just a, tip, a, a difficult subject um to broach when especially when a parent thinks that they're doing something that's safe because it's a product that was marketed for sleep mm -hmm. for example and then you read the fine print and it says that it's not intended for sleep um so trying to tell um a parent well i'm i'm glad you found something um, unfortunately that's not safe. So let's talk about what we can do in a safe environment. So, um, but really just, just talking to parents about getting them to make sure they're always putting their baby for every nap and every sleep down in a safe environment is the most important thing. So again, that bassinet, that crib, that flat surface, nothing else in it on their back. So important. Yeah. And with, with sleep training as well, it's not, I think the, connotations of sleep training have come right from you know 40 50 years ago um, so we've moved a long way from there of having to Absolutely. let your baby cry and just you know put them in bed at seven o'clock and see them at seven a.m <laughs> morning you know and don't go in um but no there's a, a lot of things that we can do that is not sleep training as such and and that will improve baby sleep definitely exactly exactly yeah so what dina what is your um baby sleep tips for new parents um so one of my sleep tips uh, is definitely as we were talking about before so talking about this the safe sleep environment for your child and and um in a new baby in a new baby in a newborn <laughs> um <laughs> having um your baby swaddled on their back um so uh my baby did not enjoy being swaddled, but the majority of babies do. So um, having them swaddled on their back, um, on in the bassinet, you know, and um, not co-sleeping in terms of um, sharing a bed, but sharing a room with your baby also helps. So having your baby right next to the bed in a separate bassinet is very helpful also because they can still see you. And um, other things that I talk about a lot are, um, using white noise machines or a shh noise um, or a noise that mimics your heartbeat um, and having um, a dark room as much as possible, um, whether that's with blackout curtains or just using trash bags on your windows, whatever it takes to kind of mimic that environment of the womb. Make sure your baby is nice and warm and not cold and that also goes in with swaddling. Um, so those are kind of the, the typical newborn things. And then when it gets, once the child starts getting out of that initial newborn period and kind of past the two month mark, we talk about um, really setting schedules. And I think babies really thrive and children in general really thrive on having a schedule um, and making your day predictable and being consistent with it. So especially when it comes to bedtime, doing the same bedtime routine um, every night around the same time. And that really helps to, to make your child able to recognize, okay, it's time to transition from playtime to sleep time now as well. Um, and also just doing things before bed, knowing that your child, if they wake up in the middle of the night, is going to need those same things to be able to go back to sleep. So for the older children, well, older infants, I should say, so the, the nine-month-old where it starts to become a habit to wake up and feed in the middle of the night versus an actual need for growth. Having the parent make sure that they've fed them and then they've done something else in between feeding them and going to bed. So whether it's then reading a story, putting them in their sleep sack, but um, not 
feeding them to sleep because then if they wake up in the middle of the night, they're going to need that same thing to be able to go back to sleep. Um, same with having the parent rock them to sleep so they're completely asleep before putting them in their, in their crib. Um, but rather having the baby be awake but drowsy and putting them in the crib so that they teach themselves how to fall asleep so that way when they wake up in the middle of the night, they can again put themselves back to sleep as well. Um, one thing I always tell parents is think of when you're in a hotel room and you wake up and you have that initial, where am I? I'm not at home. And you, you kind of have that initial anxiety. Well, that's what a child has every time they wake up in a different environment than how they went to sleep. So if they went to sleep and you were there and, or you went, if they went to sleep and there was a bottle in their mouth, then that's what they're going to need when they go back to sleep because it's really anxiety producing for them to wake up in a different environment than they went to sleep. Yeah. Yeah. And it can really turn into a habit, can't it? Like, yeah, well, it's, it's how they learn how to go to sleep. You know, I, as an adult, I even, you know, I wash my face, I go to the toilet, I lay down, but I'm on my back. I have one arm above my head, my right leg slightly bent, my head's to the right. You know, I do Mm -hmm. the exact same thing every night. And then if I wake up in the middle of the night, I do those same things to go back mm-hmm. to sleep. And babies are no different. So Exactly. And I always say, just as we are teaching them how to walk and talk, we're also teaching them a skill, which is how to go to sleep. So um, it's not just teaching them to eat and walk and talk, but this is a whole other skill for them to use for the rest of their life too. So, you know, I think... Um, kind of using that as, as this is a teaching moment and this is something that we're going to start from, you know, day one is a little hard, but <laughs> from, yeah. from a fairly early on can definitely help going forward. And that those habits that start in infancy around, you know, like well, after six month mark, but around like, especially the nine to 12 month mark, um, really can go into toddlerhood and beyond. So really establishing good patterns from them can help parents just down the line. Yeah. Well, that's a really great tip. Um, Thank you so much, Tina, for chatting with us today. And um, we hopefully found this really informative. And thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you.